a baby Shemelis. Um, again, echoing what we heard earlier today, and just tell me, gentlemen, if I'm blocking a baby's view from the camera perspective, um, but you know, you were just bemoaning the fact that the evidence linking aid and employment is almost nil, and in fact, you said you tried to look for it on Google, and what happened? <laughs> well, uh, the hits, uh, uh, I try to find if you just connect official development assistance and employment is zero. Zero hits, okay? So it's that means the there's masses out there. Nonetheless, you have been combing through a number of reports. Could you tell us exactly what you've been doing? And, and under very difficult circumstances, I might add, the African Development Bank is based in Tunis, and Tunis has had its own share of civil unrest over the past couple of months. So well done for having gotten it together. But um, tell us a little bit about the study and what its aims mm -hmm. were. Yeah, thanks, Hilary. Uh, let me take one minute of my time allotted to me uh, first to thank the audience, which is a distinguished audience, to, for being here, for uh, to listen to our story. And then, of course, to uh, Finn, who has uh, been generous enough to uh, invite ADV to this project. So we have been collaborating for quite some time now. And actually, this idea was uh, initiated by Tony and uh, Finn. So what we try to do is, as exactly you've said, uh, the evidence linking aid and employment, to my knowledge, is very difficult to track. Even in Martin's presentation, we could see after uh, uh, going through uh, hundreds of household surveys, and then you have aid, and to say, OK, aid works or not, uh, that conclusion will be difficult to, to, to attain. So, however, what we try to do is also not conventional. In, the, in that sense, it's just illustrative. It could be controversial. Uh, so I, I try to put this in context. So what we have done is we have gone through uh, ADB's uh, 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 completion reports, that's what we call them, uh, of development projects that we have financed <clears throat> in the last 20 years. That's 350 or something. Over 350 it? projects. Yeah, so a lot. So a painstaking process. And then just see whether any story in those documents about employment, about jobs. Um, so the story we got is uh, interesting in some ways uh, and probably illustrates the link between, between the two. Uh, one, we found that at least on the average, on the average for the ADB financed projects, uh, for 1.5 million US dollar we spent, it's, it was possible to link with about 400 jobs. But this uh, is, uh, has a lot of variation within the sectors where we have gone through. Okay, so what was the sector where you saw the most direct influence, the most jobs coming up? Uh, yes, I mean, more or less to the story of Gary's, uh, financing microcredit, microinsurance projects. Uh, uh, we got the highest uh, employment generated in those sectors. Um, so that was the most immediate return, the, effectively? Exactly. Okay. And uh, uh, just to, for the benefit of the audience, the uh, sectors ADB financed were agriculture and allied activities, infrastructure, education and health, uh, and of course, financing uh, micro credit, micro insurance uh, activities. But also, I would like to mention we have also looked at uh, our financing to the private sector, uh, which, which started uh, quite recently but has been growing in importance, uh, where also the job creation uh, in those sectors were significant. Okay, and I, I just want, want to come back to some, some of the kinds of numbers we're talking about, but before we, we get into, we've heard about the most successful, which was the finance. Where were the areas the least successful? Um, well, at least, I mean, uh, because I don't want to draw uh, a, a very uh, hasty conclusion on this, so the audience also not to be misled, but in areas like education and health, it seems we have quite a weak link with employment. That's where the list we're able to find. Now, I'm assuming you're not saying do not invest in education and health. Is that because no. it's a longer term to Absolutely. see the return? Yes, I mean, the, the, uh, um, everybody here knows uh, to be in the labor market, you have to be healthy. 
but also to get a good job, you have to have skills which you acquire through education. And basic so, so skills. So this, this, these are uh, quite straightforward argument. However, in, in the sense of investing in uh, catalyzing jobs, the education and employment sector is uh, the fruits you get it after after long years. The immediate job implication would be. Like, for instance, if you build a school or if you build a health station, then... So it's the same with infrastructure. Basically, you're looking at... It's the same a, thing with infrastructure, but infrastructure is much better. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to ask you to... to oh, I know this is a deadly word for an economist, but to speculate. But uh, do you think it will be possible at some point to do research... Um, because obviously there are places where you need to build infrastructure, where you need to invest in health, where there are issues that have to be addressed because it's a short-term major problem. But is there any way eventually of being able to measure what the returns are? Because I've heard a lot from a lot of you, you know, the, the, the skills issue is, is basic. I know with illness in just my own work as a journalist and then doing a lot of these conferences, you know, when you've got a population that's devastated by AIDS, it's very difficult for people to go to work. So is there any way or is it just pie in the sky to think that eventually you might actually be able to look for the data that will link the benefits of different things, be they development aid or the countries ultimately getting to the point where they can invest in these things, but where you can see a return? Or is that just an impossibility? Sorry, this is coming out of the yeah. left um, field. No, I think you, you, you're right. Um, uh, probably I take even a step back and look at the uh, perception of the audience here, uh, which believes aid should be seen more as an investment than anything else. But also, 97% say uh, they support it. So in my view, if you see it as an investment, there is a return, there is a risk to it. Mm. Um, as investment, I see, for instance, uh, what's the return is exit from aid. Countries yeah. should just be on their feet and do their own things without relying on others. Uh, yeah. What's the risk is uh, probably aid could be more harmful than uh, being useful. Yeah. So within this bounds, what we are trying to do in this exercise is to illustrate uh, if you scale up, for instance, some of the ADB type projects at uh, those countries we covered, and then uh, replicate it all over Africa, and look at the amount of total aid ODA that has flown into the economy of Africa, then what is the order of magnitude of employment you might expect? And about 10 million jobs every year would be expected. So the reason we don't find the evidence is because of the data lack, lack, uh, lack of data, uh, lack of monitoring and proper uh, tracking. Uh, but, but what we are saying is the, the evidence is out there. Okay, well, and, I want to come yeah. back to you one thing, on the, because you mentioned exit strategy. And exit strategy for aid is, I think, something that is very much on many donors' minds, because they don't want it to become just continuous. And Eve, I know this is something you've mentioned. So I... Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's important uh, that we get out of this notion that aid is here for the next 50 years, um, and, and therefore we have another phase when this phase is over. Not to say that every time that we start, uh, we then expect to be out again five years from, from, from now or seven years from now. But I think we should um, put into the um, work in preparing that what results would be achievable within five years if we were to uh, exit, if you understand. I think we need to, because we're not going to be there forever, so we yeah. need to put that into the equation. Okay, coming back, because I didn't mean to rain on your parade there, baby, no, but no, you're basically right. saying, and I, I realize that this is a hypothesis now, um, the big picture was that if you looked at everything and rolled it out, you would have seen how many jobs being created? Yeah, close to 10 million jobs every year. That's quite a, quite a big number. Now, I'm just going to take a couple of questions, but first of all, Stefan Isaacson, I'm just going to ask you. Um, Stefan is, is with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden. Okay, Stefan Andersson, um, this whole concept of exit strategies, investment, I know that we've discussed it, so I just wanted to bring you into the conversation early. 
No, I, I think that's a very good point. And I think that, I mean, in, in the long term, we are not in a position to see that development is sustainable over time. And hence the question to Martin before that, where do we actually put our money to be catalytic and actually make the difference today to exit, perhaps not tomorrow, but in the short term? We need to see where we can be adding the extra bucks to make the difference. I mean, we've been talking a lot now about, about uh, microfinancing, uh, taking the risk out of uh, some investments. And of course, these are things we could do easily, and Denmark and Sweden both could provide guarantees, for instance. Is that the way we should go and withdraw ODA? Is that what you're saying? Or, and then sort of stay only with uh, financing research? Okay, and uh, maybe uh, this isn't necessarily a question you no, need yeah. to answer. I'm throwing it into a general conversation. However, I'm going to now, um, I'm Anders Nash, and I'm going to take three. So I've got Anders, Poole, Buch Hansen, and Peter Dam. So in that order, first of all, Anders Nash. Can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> Where are um, you? Wave at me. I can't see you. Aha. Sorry, at the back. Don't here. forget your seat when you sit down. Careful. Absolutely, and don't forget the clock on me either, because <laughs> I will go on. Um, a lot of interesting points today, thanks very much, um, and a lot of discussions about um, employment that's been created. Sorry if I deviate slightly, but my questions relate to um, direct and indirect employment, and also to the formal and informal sectors. Now, we have the ambassador from Bolivia here, and Ib mentioned the project in Bolivia I was fortunate enough to work on. The impact I know cool. from that. I'm going to give you the mic as soon as we start hearing from them. But if you have a question for a baby right now. I do, now. and it's directly related to that. Okay. How highly on the agenda do you um, do you place uh, formal vis-a-vis -vis informal sectors? Um, there's a lot of informal jobs created in some of these economies we mentioned. And also direct employment you mentioned through some of the projects you're working on vis-a-vis -vis indirect employment. A baby. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, yes, Give him a clock, please. Yeah, uh, very quickly, the employment uh, we have documented is direct and indirect. But I, I, I want to uh, really uh, remind us that uh, these projects were never intended to create jobs anyway. The primary objectives, depending on the sectors of intervention, were for something else. Like, for instance, if it is building a dam, the whole engineering concept goes into that. But then uh, we picked how much employment has been created as a result of that. So there was no really intentional uh, discrimination between um, formal, informal jobs, etc. This is just an illustrative exercise. If there is any evidence out there to link between jobs and aid, then track the projects and then get some illustration and some ideas about uh, uh, what the money spent has, has managed to create opportunities. Yeah. Okay, Poul Buchhansen, and please pronounce your name if I've massacred it. Buchhansen, I'm sitting here. Buchhansen! <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I just want to uh, ask you a question related to uh, value chains which is uh, something, a concept we are talking about quite a lot these days in relation to, uh, to job creation. And there are different value, types of value chains, domestic value chains, international value chains, different sectors, different products. So my question is, does your material give you data to go into the question of which value chains are most productive in creating employments depending on which context? Thank you. Oh, this is a difficult one. Maybe the audience also can join me. Uh, anyway, um, no, it's a very interesting question because this is, as you said, uh, one of the uh, uh, topics of interest these days. Uh, even in the bank, uh, in the agriculture sector, there is now money going into enhancing what we call the value chain, agro-industry processing, etc. So, I mean, within, within that perspective, uh, what I can share with you now is we have a few private sector financed projects that have uh, exactly this kind of concept and create quite uh, a lot of jobs, especially agro-processing industries. Yeah. Okay, and the next one and last one for now is Peter Dam. Right. Uh, hello. Um, my question is uh, regarding education. If I understood um, correctly, then uh, education didn't show a, um, a very good return of investment. And I'm wondering if, if this, I mean, it depends on the setting and the country, region, of course, the family traditions, community traditions. Um, a little way further away from you, I think. Further, yeah. okay, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering 
Are there any cases where um, the education um, is not, they can't utilize it in the setting that they come from? And, and so do they ever, uh, do they experience brain drain? Do they leave, uh, leave the, uh, their homes behind to, to use their education? Or does it sometimes not, um, can they even utilize it in their settings? Uh, I th I, what sorry, I Hilary, I, yeah. I would like to you to rephrase the question. What? Uh, okay, I think what it you... was was maybe, the, and you're talking about people that have completed tertiary education, I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. So those that have completed tertiary education is one of the reasons perhaps there is not a return in the country because they couldn't find a job that paid well enough or they found a job elsewhere that paid better. So brain drain. The, uh, well, uh, I don't call it... By the, by the expression on his face, I would say that was probably not the focus of when they were doing the education. So let us assume no for now.